evening tonight. My name is uh, Hussain Asayo, uh, and this is the Torah of Tamar Al-Qadadar. We are here today, and first of all, thank you for really attending, and I hope you find this talk interesting. It's, it's a pleasure to see such a large audience. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the sea turtles of Kuwait, and uh, more specifically, saving them when they come in injured, and uh, the kind of uh, care that we do attend to them uh, in the Kuwait uh, fisheries labs. Okay. So, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start. Hi, I'm Dr. Tamara Khabazad. I'm um, a vet at various locations, actually, in Kuwait. I graduated with my bachelor's of veterinary, of uh, bachelor's of, in biology with a certificate in neuroscience from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2010. Um, I worked at a various clinics in New York uh, before returning back and working as a veterinary technician at the Kuwait Zoo. After that, I ended up going to Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine, graduated in 2016. Um, I completed my clinical year at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, currently, I work at the Kuwait Zoo, which is my main area, uh, main location. I also sometimes work at the Scientific Center of Kuwait with both aquatic and terrestrial wildlife. Um, I work with the Sea Turtle Rescue with the team. And currently, I was just signed as a collaborating vet at Sorbonne University in Abu Dhabi for their new uh, sea turtle uh, facility that they're going to be opening up. Decided to list a little bit of some of my interests. So my emphasis is actually ex zoo exotic and wildlife focused, not really small animal. Um, my, and basically on the management and treatment of them, especially with surgical and emergent procedures. I'm very interested in conservation of Middle Eastern North African wildlife, both terrestrial and aquatic. Okay. Okay, so my name is uh, Hussain Asai. I'm uh, currently the public authority for agriculture and fisheries, uh, fisheries lab supervisor. A uh, little bit of background on myself. Before coming to, uh, to Kuwait uh, to, to run the lab, uh, I was at the University of Miami, Center for Advanced Microscopy. So it's a big name for electron microscopes, a lot of analytical research. Um, previous to that, uh, at the University at Erasmus, the University of Miami, simultaneously. And uh, before that, at Nova Southeastern, where I graduated with my uh, master's in uh, marine biology. Um, and even before that, if we go back a little bit further, the uh, University of South Carolina, Columbia, for my bachelor in marine science. So the scientific interests uh, are a little varied. Uh, I think it's worth noting because you will find, surprisingly, but you will find that when you, a wide scope of interest actually comes in very handy when dealing with the issues we're going to discuss in a little bit. But uh, very quickly, uh, some of the major interests and publications that I've done in the past were using, uh, looking at exopolymeric secretion, kind of sunk my teeth in marine biology there. Uh, coral calcification. And uh, medical application, you know, I used to hear that before going into marine biology, that medicine and marine biology go hand in hand. But I was, I'm still amazed how much one field complements the other to this day. And uh, for the last uh, six years, I've been really researching the dynamic ecosystem of Kuwait Bay, which I will just say very briefly is perhaps unique in its, in its scope and its diversity. There's, I haven't found anything similar uh, yet, globally, that we can compare it to. So it's a very unique, special, special place. So, very briefly, a little bit of background on uh, some of the major accomplishments of the lab over the last few years. Maybe over here it's a little easier. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed when we're looking at the fish and fish, especially in Kuwait, they, they're the, the basis of the ecosystem. They're very closely related to. Actually, this one. So they're very closely, the, the mullet, the maid, which everybody loves, is the basic uh, food part of the food pyramid. Uh, they correlate very strongly with rain. And this was a big surprise for us. Very, very strongly with rain. But there's a lag. There's a little bit of a lag here. So when it rains, they spawn more. But by the time they grow old enough to be measured, it's about a, a year, a year and a half later. So keep that in the back of your head. This year we had a lot of rain. So next, 
mullet season when it opens. Uh, you know, it should be cheaper. <laughs> supply yep. Yeah. So there's your supply right there. So, and the other thing we do, uh, we do try very hard, is to use the samples that come to us for educational outreach, which is one of the things we're hoping to do today. Uh, this is perhaps the biggest sample that came to our lab ever. Uh, two year, three years ago now, we had a 45 ton uh, Bridey's whale that was uh, that died of a boat collision in uh, Kuwait Bay. <laughs> the one area of study that I really enjoy, Kuwait Bay. So, uh, we ended up with this uh, whale carcass beautiful specimen and uh, very quickly we got her we took her out of the port we buried her and washed her and then we cleaned the bones and we installed the bones and this is the final uh, whale skeleton it's currently on display in the main building of the public authority which is open it's public so please swing by Rabia and, and see her uh, one of the again the oh wait yeah one of the things that we did uh, once we accomplished it, got myself a little patent out of it. Believe it or not, uh, when we did this, there was really uh, no protocol for actually uh, removing the lipids from the bones, which make a lot of smell. And uh, people complained about the smell. So we spent, I spent nine months doing a lot of R&D and found a way to remove the lipids. It's about 60% lipids in those bones. We got it out of there and got a patent. So science is fun and productive, okay? It does work. Okay, so one more thing I'd like to talk about is the, the lab itself. It's separated from the main campus. It's off on the 7th Ring Road near Doha. And it's uh, isolated and pristine in its beauty. So if, you're ever, if you ever make it there, just, you know, you'll find me and see our work anytime you want. You're more than welcome to. And lastly, I'd like to just before we even get started, I'd like to special mention some of our star employees that have gone in above and beyond. Uh, Abdullah Sayyid Omar, Badri al and uh, our, uh, Amani. They, I mean, without them, nothing would happen. And I'm so pleased that they can make it and they are here today. It really makes a difference. So thank you. Okay, so now the topic at hand, sea turtles. So, <coughs> There are seven known species or described species of sea turtles globally. Uh, they're listed here, there's six listed here. There's the flatback turtle, it's mainly in Australia, so we're not gonna worry too much about it. The turtles that are, have been reported here, uh, the leatherback, the green, the hawksbill, the, uh, the loggerhead, and the olive ridley. There was one reported case, one reported case, and also one reported case. These two, the hawksbill and the green are the most common species. Uh, they are found throughout Kuwait. I mean, in, from Bubian Island all the way down to the coast. They're kind of rare here. They're more common further south in the, in the Gulf. Uh, and they're even more common in uh, Amman and the, the Indian Ocean there. But we do get them here. Mostly seasonal because we get cold water temperature, cold temperatures in the winter. So they migrate further south in the winter. And uh, that becomes an issue when treating them, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, lastly, the islands here are an important nesting site. So you, they've been here, they, they, they come back to the same site, and when the eggs hatch, they also return to the same location to, to nest as adults. So nesting sites is a very critical shoreline, is a very critical part in the entire sea turtle uh, life. Okay, so they are all considered threatened or endangered species. So they're protected, sea turtles are protected globally. There's different uh, levels of threat, you know, orange, yellow. Uh, there's different threat levels for the different species. So green turtles are considered threatened, but not endangered. The, the leatherbacks are endangered. So there's, there's, you know, it changes from time to time, but generally speaking, they all need to be protected. Their life cycle, their reproductive cycle is so slow that one loss is a, is a big deal. And in this part of the world, in Kuwait, we project there's probably about 20 recurring turtles that come and go. So 20 turtles in the entire, it's worth protecting. Uh, they consume mainly seagrass. They do also eat jellyfish and sponge. Uh, one thing that, that certain turtles will do, they will, as they get older, they become herbivorous. So when they're younger, they will eat jellyfish and crustaceans and shrimp and what have you, mullet 
and as they get older, they will switch to being exclusively vegetarian. So that happens more so with the green turtles than the, uh, the others. The others will snack, but most of the time they switch to a vegetarian or a jellyfish diet when they get older. Um, the main problem that sea turtles face today are, are human, human issues. So the uh, fishing nets is an issue that they get entangled and this is something unfortunately that happens more often than it should. Uh, they also have, you know, okay, so you ban fishing nets in turtle areas, but then they start showing up with fish hooks. So there's a balance that you have to come up with. Okay, you're, you're gonna have some problems. What can you treat, what can you not? So these are the kind of issues we deal with. Uh, well, this issue here, not such a big deal, especially, you know, every now and then you see a video on WhatsApp of somebody predating on a sea turtle, uh, you know, and the backlash, the public backlash is so strong. So the, the, the public, especially in this part of the world, is pretty much against eating sea turtles. So we don't worry too much about human predation. But in other parts of the world, turtle eggs, turtle soup, it's, uh, it's a delicacy. So there's a huge gap in trying to explain about protecting them and not eating them. So it's worth noting. Okay, so like I said, this is uh, Gano Island, and uh, you will get sea turtles there. Uh, the migration, generally speaking, begins around mid-October. Mid-October, when the wind starts to shift, they start disappearing from, from our waters and they go further south. And uh, like I said before, we expect about 20, and probably of those 20, 15 would be, or 18 would be either green or a hawksbill turtle. Okay. The turtles that we've been seeing here in the last two and a half years that I've been here have actually been rescued in a really debilitated state. And you can tell as we go through these slides, you start to see um, the changes in their shells. If you look here, um, all of this epibiota, which we'll talk about later, but basically barnacles, leeches, algae that attach themselves to the shells of these turtles. Naturally, they are naturally occurring species. Generally, a turtle will have one or two species of epibiota on them, but they'll knock them off they'll, uh, if they start to accumulate. And so when they accumulate like this, it means that they're spending a lot of time at the bottom. And it's weighing them down, and it means that they're spending too much energy trying to swim, and they don't have that energy. Uh, this is probably the worst case I've ever seen, and we'll talk about her later. They're generally dehydrated, um, often very weak from being emaciated and anorectic, so hungry as well, and uh, some of them actually have pre-existing pre pre -condi pre conditions. So we're going to go through also the clinical treatment. Um, so we're going to go through six turtle case histories and also all of their diagnosis and treatment in detail with videos and photos. And we will definitely try to make it a little bit easier for you to understand. Okay, so before we get into the, 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 medical, uh, the medical files for each of these turtles, the issue of having to deal with these turtles, especially in this case, in the cases where they come in the winter time, is to keep them warm and to provide them a suitable environment to keep them healthy and fed and recover. So some of the things we've had to come up with and invent uh, doing, doing this, this work uh, was one of these, uh, this tank we had to kind of create for this specific case, which Victoria come out and talk about. Uh, this turtle was treated, so therefore could not be immersed in water. But cannot put it next to a heater, it's winter time. So we had to kind of put her in a jacketed incubator so that she's surrounded by hot water that can keep her body temperature warm, but not direct heat that can, you know, cause problems, further problems and dry her out. Okay, 
So the other thing we have had, these, these we, 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 we call them the rest cubes because they're a cube tank. These tanks were very useful when dealing with these turtles because they're small enough that we can keep an eye on the turtle, make sure it doesn't exert too much energy and recover, uh, as well as be able to control the environment. And however big enough that they can sink, at the, sink to the bottom. And the, the ability of having a little bit of depth became very useful because a lot of them end up with trapped gas. And it saved us from having to do a lot of, a lot of operations. So the depth here was key to removing a lot of these gas, let, letting them heal themselves. But basically we used um, you know, coral lights that provide the right amount of wavelength stimulus, um, skimmers, filters, and perhaps most importantly, and I'll talk about this again in a minute, but the salinity. Most of these turtles come in dehydrated and they're saltwater turtles. And it goes against common thinking, but it turns out to be very useful that when they first come in, we actually put them in fresh water, pure fresh water. And this allows them to rehydrate. And then gradually we acclimate them back to saltwater. That step seems to have been very useful in succeeding, in succeeding in, in rehabilitating these turtles and saving them. Now in one case, and this is the current case we have, uh, we've had to develop the turtle acclimation natural time, the tank, okay? So this turtle, she's very big. And uh, we've had to actually convert a freshwater tank reservoir into an aquarium uh, to house her. So what we did was we put this in a greenhouse so that she can get the natural sunlight, which they need for healing. Uh, also, uh, we had to actually go out to sea and pump water and get it into there and have set up our own filtration system, develop our own filtration system, uh, to house Aziza, which Dakota Tamara will tell you more about. But uh, she is currently with us at the lab. Uh, she's, she's almost done, she's almost ready to go home. Uh, one of the things we've had problems with was with her, you know, she eats lettuce and food does get stuck in the intake. Uh, this was really a learning process. There's really, you can't Google how to set up a, <laughs> the turtle hospital tank. So we've had to learn how, you know, there's a lot of trial and error, but we developed these the skimmers back here, the overflow system, a bunch of pipes back there. We've had actually to, um, to figure out a way to keep her warm in the winter. Now, mind you, she had come, we'll talk about it later, but she's been here through the winter. So how do you keep a cold-blooded animal warm? And, you know, the only thing between her and the, and the outside world is, you know, one, two millimeters of glass. So it was a, it was a challenge. And, but that said, she's uh, very friendly. Okay. Okay, so again, going back to very briefly about the sunlight. We, we, we tried this, the artificial lights, they work, but they don't work well. With extended stays, we've noticed that turtles, and they stopped eating. They started losing weight, and uh, if they were people, you'd say they were depressed. And we didn't know why, uh, and I have to give credit to uh, our, uh, Ms. Madriya, who really was intuitive about it. She said, they need sunlight, they need sunlight. Try it. I said, okay, we'll try it. And sure enough, 10 minutes outside, their appetite came back and they felt great. So sunlight, you know, coral lights don't work that well. And I wouldn't have believed it until I saw it with my own eyes, I'm a coral guy. So, but anyway, so when they do stay, we have, you know, it's, it's mainly, a, it's not really a, it's teamwork. It's teamwork, it's almost volunteer teamwork in some cases. So the staff, they love them and they take care of them and they keep an eye on them. So things work out well. Uh, okay. Okay, so I'll just uh, go ahead and introduce the six cases uh, before I hand over the mic. Our first case that had come in, uh, I'm using their common names just to keep things easy, because they're two species. So this is a green turtle. Her name, uh, we called her Jamila. Uh, followed a couple years later by Susan. Uh, a year later by Rosie. Uh, sorry, Susan, so Susan is also a green. Uh, Rosie is a hawk's bill. Sorry, the other way around. Susan's a hawk's bill, Rosie's the green. And Harald, are uh, the only male turtle that came in. He's a green sea turtle. He was the only male. So all the others have been female. And Susan again, yeah, two years later, 
And I, I've, I've sworn that if she pops up again, I'm just gonna have to keep her somewhere. Too. <laughs> she doesn't want to go back. This is what happened. I couldn't believe it. And currently, Azizen, uh, also a green turtle and uh, a nice, big, mature female green turtle. Okay. Okay. So. So we'll briefly go through each turtle, and then what we'll do is we'll go through the three clinical studies, uh, the, three, the three clinical signs that we've seen for cases. Um, so this is Jamila. I actually wasn't here for her, but she kind of showed up floating, um, a little bit malnourished. Her intake was in 2013, and she was released a few months later. Um, so this was a surgery that was done, um, it's called a silovacentesis. We'll talk about what a coelom is uh, when I talk about a little bit of the anatomy and physiology so that I'm not bombarding you with medical terms. Uh, but basically that's the inguinal fossa and if, uh, if an animal's buoyancy issue isn't resolving, and there could be excess gas inside her coelom. So basically what, what happened was over two surgeries they extracted 1.7 liters of air to help her. It's really easy to fall in love with these animals, by the way. They're very emotional. And you'll see later with Aziza. Uh, this is Susan, part one. So this is the first time she came. She liked us so much, she came back. Um, so she was found by the Alzor power plant. Uh, pretty healthy, they just kind of found her, and then she was released basically within a month. She's really characteristic. We actually didn't realize it was her until like a few months ago uh, when we were looking through these videos. But she has a very characteristic little, like that little point on her head. And then also the way her scoots are arranged, her shell, it's, uh, it's a little bit jagged. She's a really interesting one. This is Rosie. Rosie was the first one that I, uh, that I met actually broke into the diving center with Abdullah to meet her. Um, but basically she was a chunky monkey about 16.5 kilograms. She was found by the, by the power plant because um, the power plants kind of put out chemicals and then bring in water. She was just sitting there like, ah, like eating all the fish and anything that was coming her way. <laughs> she looks really happy right there. She's ready to go. Um, so this is Harold, we uh, got him last year. He's a green. Um, he came in floating as well, and we'll talk about why he was here. And he was released a few months later. He basically was just done with being with us and wanted to leave. He was really eager to leave. Susan. <laughs> Probably the worst case I've ever seen on any animal, actually. <laughs> Um, so this is when Susan came back. She probably realized that we would help her, so we came back for help. She came in on the 31st of January and she was released nine months later. We actually never thought she was going to make it, but she did. She came in at 1.24 kilograms, so she weighed nothing, and she left uh, about a kilogram and a half later. Um, we'll go through her case as well. So this is Aziza, 95 kilos. It takes four people to move her. Um, <laughs> She's, uh, she's definitely an older turtle, maybe around 50 years old. She came in on Halloween. She came in to party. Um, so hopefully she'll be released soon, but she came in for a propeller strike. Uh, she was found floating as well. Uh, we decided to run x-rays this day, and it was like playing Tetris, <laughs> trying to figure out the best angle to get at least a quarter of her on the slide. Hassan's first workout of the year. Yeah. <laughs> All of that was for one lung field, by the way. It's just one of them, and I wanted them to do four. So <laughs> they look, the lung fields look great, though. So that was that was a very nice uh, surprise. Uh, 
thank you, Nadine, for the wonderful video. Nadine over there actually filmed all of Isis' stuff for us. Um, so that's the fracture she came in with, by the way. But this is after the blood here. We'll go through that. So, before I uh, bombard you with a lot of medical terms, we'll go through some basic anatomy and physiology so that you'll understand how these animals work because they're very different from us. First thing is that they're heliotherms. So that means that they get their heat from the sun or a warmer medium. And they generally like being around 25 to 30 degrees, just like I do. Um, their shell is insulating for them and it's comprised of two layers with an in, in a medium layer as well. So the first layer is bone derived from cartilage, which is um, also provides anchoring for the muscles. And what you see on the outside is the epidermis and it's keratinized dermis or cornified dermis. Um, the middle layer in between the two is actually vascular germinative, germinative layer, which means that it can regenerate, it feels and it bleeds. So when you come in and someone's like, oh, my turtle broke his shell, that's actually incredibly painful. It's like you smashed a bone and now it's exposed to the world. Um, the carapace is the upper part and the plastron is the bottom part. And they're very different um, So in, in, what they're, in what they've developed from. So the carapace itself is actually comprised of 50 bones and it's, and it's comprised of ribs and vertebra. The vertebra is actually fused to the dermis, right? So it's actually fused to like all of those scales that you see on the top. Um, you have four different types of scoots. So scoots are what is, one of these is a scoot. Okay. So you've got the nuchal scoot, you've got vertebral scoots, you've got coastal scoots on this side and this side, and then you have the marginal scoots. Some people like to label them a little bit differently, but generally you can tell a species of a turtle based on how many, um, they're basically varied. So some will have more vertebral, some will have more coastal, and that's basically how you can use for identification, as well as the beak, depending on how they're eating. The plastron is the bottom part. So it's right here, comprised between 12 to 13 scoots, and it's fused from the clavicle and the interclavicle, which is the pe pe uh, pectoral girdle, as well as the gastralia, which is the uh, abdominal ribs. Okay, so this is where it gets really fun because they're very, very different from us. Um, the respiratory system is, like turtles can be underwater for months without coming up to breathe. And how does that work? So I'm about to tell you. First thing, what they have is uh, they have a coelom, which means that they have no diaphragm. So a coelom is essentially a tube. Um, the, <coughs> the upper shell, the carapace, is uh, the lung. The, the top part of the lungs are fused to that through connective tissue, and the bottom part of the lungs are fused to a connective membrane that, that's attached to the liver, the intestines, and the stomach. Um, so basically, they're kind of just. Uh, they're connected to other parts of the animal, which actually helps them to breathe. So because they don't have a diaphragm, they don't rely on negative pressure the way we do. If we get a puncture in our side, one of our lungs will, or both, will deflate. That's called a pneumothorax. They don't actually suffer from this unless they have a puncture to the lung. And the reason why is because you have two muscles that work against each other, which are your transverse abdominis and your oblique. Your transverse abdominis goes around and the oblique is to the side. And when one, inc when one contracts, the other one relaxes and vice versa. So what happens is you're increasing or decreasing the pressure inside the coelom to make the lungs work, inflate or deflate. Um, that's why Aziza never came in in respiratory distress because her lungs were perfect, even though she had a complete defect in her shell. Um, they also have accessory respiration for when they're diving. So they have the bucopharyngeal region, which is about 49%, the cloacal versa, which is about 33%. And what these do is this region, if you can look into here, actually have these finger-like projections called papilla. And what the papilla do is they extract oxygen from water. So when the uh, sea turtle is diving and it opens its mouth, it increases pressure to have water rush in against the papilla, and that way it can extract oxygen and, oxygen, and oxygen, oxygenate the systemic circulation. The same thing with the cloacal bursa. 
So what these do is they can, they actually are only in some species, not all, and when they work, whether in cold water or warm water, differs between species. Hello. Um, so the cloacal versa inflate or deflate based on, based, on, uh, based on the time of the year. Okay. What's also really cool about these animals is the entire GI tract, so the gastrointestinal tract, can extract water and um, the frequency of feeding. Cardio. Okay, is everybody still with me? Are we lost? We're with you. Okay, great. <laughs> That's all I need to know. Um, so the, the, the Chelonian or turtle heart is actually very interesting in terms of that it's called a, non, a three-chambered non-crocodilian heart, which means it has two atria and, a, and, a, and, a, and one ventricle. This ventricle is separated by a septum. So as mammals, this is actually closed, right? With them, it can kind of shunt back and forth, but the body does a really good job on not mixing as, as oxygenated and deoxygenated blood as much as we think it does. So um, what happens is it's very different in terms of aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Aerobic meaning normal breathing, so we'll start with that. So blood from the body, so now all of the, the oxygen has left the, left the blood and gone into the tissues, comes back deoxygenated into the right atrium. It then goes into the cave and pulmonale, and is sorry. It's going into the cave, the cave and venosum, and then into this little pocket right here called the cave and pulmonale. This is also a really weird side bag that these that this chamber has. And from there, it's going to go via the pulmonary arteries into the lungs, and from the and from the lungs via the pulmonary vein back into the left atrium, down to the left ventricle, and into two aortic arches. To the body. Also, what happens is some of the blood will actually shunt back into the cave and pulmonale and go back to the back to the lungs. So you do get oxygenated blood back to the lungs. Now, when they're diving and they can't have oxygen, it actually completely bypasses going into the lungs. So it will just shunt back to the body. And because you have these accessory respiration respiratory organs, it, it's not going to have. A, anoxia or like a lack of oxygen while they're diving and that's why they can stay underwater for so long. Okay, so we'll start with our first medical condition. This one's Aziza. Um, so first is we'll start with traumatic injury. So she had a propeller strike, she was found floating and generally they're, sometimes it happens when they come up for air Sometimes if they're debilitated or they have a buoyancy issue, they'll be floating and something will get them. If they're entangled, sometimes uh, they'll get stuck in a fishing net and put onto a boat and they'll slam them down and they'll get a fracture of some sort. Um, so she got hit in the nuchal scoot right here. Since you all know your anatomy, I'm sure you're very well versed by now. And now also your vertebral scoot. So hers was right about there. You can argue also a little bit on, the, on a costal scoot, but we're not gonna go that far. Um, so what we did with her is she had a lot of necrotic bone. So we sedated her and gave her like, a tiny bit of sedation, a little bit of painkillers, uh, anti-inflammatories. She's not this calm anymore, actually. She's very happy. Um, so we divided the bone with this, tried to smooth it down because it was growing over jagged and there was a lot of dead pieces and a lot of debris in there um, from being in the water and got it down to where it was bleeding. Then we flushed it with dilute betadine and uh, went through proper wound care. So we found this protease modulating matrix, this thing, um, which helps with um, uh, tissue growth and regulating the medium that it's growing on. So it's also an antibacterial. It kind of popped it on there and hoped it would seal over. Actually, it was kind of useless. I mean, I think it did great for the first few days, but then uh, she was still a little bit tilted when she was floating and then popped off and she sank. So that was nice to know. <laughs> um, but it was a nice experimental thing to start. Started her on some broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, both gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic. Um, and she's doing fantastic. She eats about seven lettuce heads a day. 17 lettuce heads a day. We're taking donations. Um, <laughs> So we have a few of these that came in with pre-existing pathology. Basically, we're not quite sure how these, how these things happen, right? So Rosie came in. Uh, Rosie was the chunky monkey one, just kind of sitting by the plant, uh, sun tanning. And so she had all of these red lesions on her skin. So we call this erythema, a little bit of ulceration. And what we think is because these plants put out chemicals to clean the water is that it kind of irritated her skin. 
she was fine when he started to abuse. Nothing, it was just something that would have healed over, over time by itself. Jamila had a buoyancy disorder, and that's what we talked about with the Siloma synthesis. Um, she had some carofacial abrasions. She had a little bit of ecchymosis, so it looked like little spots of bleeding on her shell. Um, but she came in malnourished. Unfortunately, you can't really tell what happened to her, whether one came from the other or not. Maybe something hit her, kind of uh, caused a little bit of a, of a hole somewhere or a gap somewhere, and that's why she started exploding. She was malnourished, so she can't die. Aziza had this weird thing um, in her flippers. They ended abruptly, right there. And we started to notice it because when she was in the shallow tank, she couldn't be in full water when we had her wound open. Um, eventually, I started putting an, uh, an antibiotic on her that was waterproof because we tried to kind of seal the Tupperware on top, but with the shape of her shell, it didn't work very well. She kept injuring them as she was swimming. Um, and when we looked at them, we just put more antibiotic ointment on and transferred her to a bigger, bigger holding, to, uh, the big one, the big tank that came in built. But with the distal flippers, sometimes with cold chalk, which I'll talk about in a second, they do get frostbite on the tips of their fingers. So this could have been something that happened years ago, but we're not quite sure. We also don't know her migratory pattern yet. This is Harold. Harold came in uh, for cold shock, which I'll talk about that next. But he also, he when we were moving him from one of the tanks to the other, he hit his flipper on a table, or not quite sure what happened. But he started to swim in circles. And we got a little bit worried, so we brought him in for an x-ray. And we noticed that there was a little bit of pathology in this shoulder compared to this. Can you guys see how this doesn't look as bumpy and nice as this? Uh, obvious? Okay. So we're looking at a little bit of swelling and effusion. We had a decreased range of motion, like one was like small and the other one was like a normal flipper. We have lysis of the humeral head right here. This is the humerus, which is analogous to this bone. Here is your scapula, here is your acromion, and here is your coracoid. And you can see lysis on all of these heads. Mostly here you can see a little bit of just cartilage lysis, but this one has bone lysis. Um, this looks like he had a septic joint at some point. So that means that there was disease in this joint. Something was uh, got in there through sometimes malnourishment it happened. You get spread of diseases through the blood. You can localize them there. Uh, if they have poor perfusion, so example, he had some entanglement. If, his, if there was a fishing line around his, his arm at one point, not enough blood was getting there. And uh, any type of immunosuppression can all cause this. And um, generally, this looks like it resolved by itself. So these animals, and most animals actually have the ability to control disease mechanisms or infection by nor normal cellular defense. And I think that's what happened with him. Sometimes in some of the studies that I've seen, and there aren't too many published, you will see that it actually will progress to complete lysis of one of these bones or all of these bones all the way up to the flippers. And with him, it didn't. Actually, his clinical signs resolved and we thought it was better for him to go breed because we need more of these animals in the wild. And we, since he was swimming fine, we released him. Okay. I know this is a little bit weird to say, but this is by far my favorite medical condition because it's so difficult to deal with. Uh, this is cold stunning. So cold stunning happens when you have a sudden drop in temperature below 10 degrees Celsius. This is the documented definition. Um, so we get these debilitated sea turtles that show up, and it's usually some oceanographic, geographic, um, unexplained meteorologic change that happens from wind, current, and temperature. In Dubai, they're currently studying wind um, and effects of uh, cold stunning or, or just debilitated sea turtles. And usually they come in really emaciated, anemic, and with decreased plasma protein. Plasma proteins are what keeps your blood in its compartment within the vessels. So if you don't have plasma proteins, what happens is the fluid that's in your veins or in your cells are gonna start leaking out into your body cavities. Um, fortunately, she did not have that. Also, turtles are really weird in that they can function on an extremely low hematocrit. Normal hematocrit's around 20, uh, 35, let's say, and they can function normally at below five. Hematocrit is also like the, your red blood cell content. So this is Susan. Harold wasn't as bad. He was just floating, a little bit of epibiota on him for the barnacles. But, but this was a, a completely different ballgame. Um, actually, I wasn't even sure if she was alive when we first saw her. So this was her problem list. First thing, the water 
was around 12 degrees Celsius. Um, she was poorly responsive, which is a negative prognostic indicator, meaning that she will most likely die, not most likely live. Um, and usually it's grounds for euthanasia in most cases, which is uh, a good death, so we can put them to sleep. Nutritional disease, uh, severely emaciated, and sometimes when they're actually emaciated, because you have something called serous atrophy of fat, you have these um, PCBs and organophosphates in the water, and we found they found in studies that they're highly concentrated in the blood, probably because they have they're lipophilic and they like being in the fat, and there's no fat. So some of these animals come in completely intoxicated. Um, she was completely emaciated, can be from secondary immunosuppression, um, maybe pneumonia, maybe septicemia. In, in free-ranging turtles, you need to find the pro primary problem. Nutritional disease in turtles in tanks or in aquariums, usually because your temperature is off. Regurgitation, another negative prognostic indicator, generally caused by ileus, meaning the, the GI system is not working. Some sort of obstruction, sometimes parasites, but we did a fecal and she came out negative, so that was nice. Um, also can be dehydration, some sort of systemic disease, malnutrition, right? We talked about the pre transit time with, with the gut. Sometimes it's the frequency of feeding, the temperature. A buoyancy disorder, so floating. Um, so it can be any sort of gas accumulation in the body, can be from GI disease, can be a fracture to the shell. Sometimes pneumonia also causes it. Sometimes if, they're, if they've got uh, blockages in the intestine, they have too much air, so they're floating as well. Shell integrity. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I, I mean, all of these are pretty much trying to come off. If you look at the side of her shell, none of this looks normal. Like none of this looks like it's a, it's a healthy shell. Even here, you can see all these indentations. Uh, you can see all this epibiota. And right here, she's got a bunch of abscesses. So that is a bone that's sticking out. Generally, they start having uh, abscesses when they're having decreased blood flow. And uh, you have to debride them, but they're not like, you see human abscesses. I don't know who watches pimple popping videos. I don't, uh, because I see them live <laughs> on animals. But you know how like with mammals, it kind of squirts out? It doesn't happen like that in reptiles. It's caches. It looks like cottage cheese. Sorry for ruining your dinner. Um, but this, this was really nervous, uh, nerve wracking to debride because her bone was right there. And think about the amount of pain this animal is in. They're really good at not showing pain. Uh, septicemia, so basically disease in the body at some, at, in some areas. If you look at this, <coughs> when you look like, um, if you look at the inside of your mouth, right? It's usually nice and pink and healthy and it's like moist. Uh, I don't know what color this is. It's more like a purple, red, Pale, so she definitely has some anemia because she's pale, um, and then the purple and, and the pink, the red, kind of tell me that she has septicemia as well. Basically, I wasn't really sure. Like we gave her a zero point zero five percent chance to live, so she was really bad. Uh, I wanted to compare X-rays. So surprisingly, her lungs were great. This was the, the only thing that was great about her when she came in was that there was no pathology. Right here, this is a really nice lung field. You can ignore all of these barnacles on her. I think basically, how long did it take you to take them off? Two weeks, something yeah. like that? Yeah, Just a week. Because her shell was coming off. It was flaking off and we didn't want to damage it. Actually, if you looked at the right, her midline, it was caved in. And since they don't have any protection around their heart, we were really nervous that her heart was gonna lacerate as we were moving her. Um, she's got a fracture right there on the wrist, right? Because um, remember we talked about the shell, so if there's a fracture in the shell, generally since the ribs are fused and the, the vertebral column is fused, miss the vertebral column completely. Um, right here is like a really nice photo of her lungs minus all of this. This is from a study just to show that this is what pneumonia looks like. So it's all of these little bubble lesions, they're called honeycomb, so the honeycomb appearance. You can see it here. And you can see this side of this other animal is completely consolidated. And this one doesn't look so bad. So this is what pneumonia looks like, and that's not what she looked like. Okay, so this is kind of what we did. Uh, it, took, it took a little bit of time to get her going because you wanna make sure that you're not shoving medications at them when, they're, when their body temperature isn't up um, at a certain level or else the body can't metabolize it. 
So put her in fresh, fresh water for about 24 hours. Sometimes they can get rehydrated through the, through the hind end, through the coleca. IV bolus of isotonic fluids and a little bit of dextrose right into the cervical sinus. So you put a needle right into there. Um, you can do fluids into the coelom directly or through the mouth for maintenance. That's what we switched her on eventually. We gave her some saline with some dextrose. So dextrose is just sugar, just kind of to get the body awake again. Your blood cells need sugar, your, your neurons need sugar, that's how they survive. And all the fluids should be room temperature. We did broad spectrum antibiotics. We started her immediately first on uh, injections and then we switched her to oral. Um, this one burns a little bit and rifloxacin, broad spectrum antibiotics, you have to dilute it with water or else you know it hurts. Um, and the metronidazole is pretty disgusting to the taste. So we were mixing it with fluid with uh, a really easily digestible critical care formula um, called critical care Oxpo. Um, and then we did abscess debridement and wound care which actually took a lot of time. So at first we did sugar bandages to debride the abscesses um, and they, those were changed daily. She was dry docked so that she wouldn't be sinking and causing the sugar to fly everywhere and kind of defeats the purpose. It was eventually started to clean with dilute betadine and then we did a waterproof antibiotic as well. Okay. Anti-inflammatory medications because no one wants to be in pain. Uh, iron dextran and cobalamin. Uh, iron dextran basically helps with the regeneration of red blood cells and cobalamin is B12, which also helps with red blood cells, but also helps with digestion. Nutritional support. So you start at about 7% body weight and you weigh them daily to see how they're going. Um, because the last thing you want is an animal gaining weight and it's because there's fluid in the abdomen. So we were tube feeding her critical care formula just because she was so unresponsive. We were scared that she wouldn't swallow. And since she was regurgitating already, uh, it's just easier to put it straight into the belly. Yeah. Um, and then we give her 1cc cod liver oil because in the x-ray you could see there was ingesta just sitting there and we wanted the, the gut to start moving. Freshwater soaps always help with rehydration and also to get that epibiota off. And this is, this is working in the same bathroom. <laughs> um, there's also, we did, there's a study that came out with uh, bladder stones and tortoises that showed that if you use it on a really nice slow wave, it will actually help break up the stones. So we did it to kind of help with her uh, intestinal motility and it worked really well. I've done it in a few tortoises, so we decided to try it on her with a pad, of course, because donors shall spray. Just, um, okay. So with, with cold sunning, it's always, you have to warm them up before you start giving them anything orally or else nothing's gonna function. So here is our new proposition, which we've been working on for the last two years, is um, we talked about the definition as a wintertime phenomenon where it drops below 10 degrees centigrade. And I actually talked to one of the vets who did the study with the radiographs in, um, in Tufts, and he said, I, never, I didn't realize that the water got that low, below 10. So a lot of the studies are done in North America. We don't see 10 degrees Celsius water here, but we still see cold sun sea turtles. And so does the Emirates. The Emirates doesn't see anything below 18. So we don't really have that many studies in the Middle East. So we're going to propose changing the definition to include regional attributes because our turtles are acclimated to our waters and including the declination, so the degree of the drop of temperature instead of a concrete temperature like 10 or 12. Um, a little bit of evidence to support this, that it's not just below 10, is because you have strandings at 12 in Cape Cod. In South Wales, there are species that are around 15 to 17 that, can, that are lethargic but functioning. And then in New South Wales, again, there's another population that are slow but still active at four to eight. So this means that these, these turtles are actually acclimated to these types of waters. So 10 doesn't make sense. Um, and of course, just like we said in the UAE, they're having them at 18 degrees Celsius. Okay. The technical issue the turtles had maintaining them out of their environment is also technically challenging. With Aziza that you saw earlier in the big tank, this was actually, I'm, I put it here because I'm, I have to admit, I'm a little proud of my, myself on this one. Uh, this water, the, the temperature outside reached zero and almost negative zero, it's in an open desert area. How do you heat a water tank this big? And this it kept getting colder and colder, and the turtles kind of regress, get worse. 
Finally, I don't know how, but he came to me, and uh, I went down to the local jacuzzi store. And I asked them for a jacuzzi water heater, and actually they were suspicious. They said, how big is your swimming pool? And I said, what swimming pool? <laughs> anyway, so when I explained to them what happened, they actually gave me a very nice discount on this English-made uh, titanium-coated uh, heating element, and it's fantastic. It worked great. I mean, it could snow outside and the turtle temperature, 28 degrees on the money. So, you know, I, I want to point it out that we had to figure out ways to do this with what's available locally. Okay. Okay, one other thing, we said rehydrate and salinity, rehydrate and salinity. With the bigger tank, we actually had to go and get water from the sea. But most of the smaller rescues, we would buy the salt, this uh, aquarium salt from the pet stores, we buy it and mix our own salt. This gives us the ability to maintain uh, different salinities and make sure the water is not polluted or anything. It eliminates a lot of issues. So in case you're wondering how we, you make salt, seawater, sea you can buy it. Okay. Okay, so then we're done. And then when we're done with these turtles, we, the point is they don't stay. We don't like to have anything stay long. So once they're healthy, they're fit, the environment is good, we release them. Rule number one, no release in winter, which is why Aziz is still here. We're waiting for the water temperature to, to get warm enough that we can release her. Yeah. Um, the other thing is we try to take them away from people during weekdays, there's no one there. Uh, on these islands, it's quiet so we can work on them and release them there. And there's two types of releases that we see, the sprint and the, the swim. So rarely, but with Susan twice, uh, <laughs> she likes to take you with her when you release her. So we, we swim along and we get some beautiful footage and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. After months of dealing with them and, and you know, to go out to sea and swim with them a little bit and have some fun and see them okay, it's, it's great. Most of the time, as soon as you put them in the water, they disappear and you hope to never see them again. Okay. Okay, so what do we learn, what, we, what do we need going forward? Very quickly, the things that we, we, we've managed to figure out most of the stuff, but the things that we do need, uh, Susan was the, the final nail in the coffin. I said, we need, we need to get GPS. I wasn't a big fan of tagging these turtles. I said, you know, they come in in such a bad state, just treat them and release them. But at this point, since they're starting to become recurring cases, I think uh, we're gonna need to get some of these things. Um, also with Aziza, the biggest case we have right now, she came from North. She came from right outside Bubian. Now these are sea turtles. So Bubian is practically brackish and there's some, some uh, suggestion that they're actually going into the rivers. And a GPS would really help point, point us in the right direction with this. Because I don't think at this point sea turtle applies. I think they're just turtle everywhere. They can live in fresh, they can live in salt. But it would be interesting to, to track her and see where she goes. If we can get this done before we release her in a few weeks, that'd be great. If not, next turtle. Uh, and then some of the things that we could really, would really help with diagnosis. I mean, some of the stuff we had to forego or go find equine hospitals to help us with. But uh, if we were to do this, uh, we, if we could ask Santa, this is what we would ask him for, okay? And uh, this is our concluding slide. I just want to leave you with the, just a little bit of uh, information. This is from yesterday, by the way. So she's uh, very playful. We decided to just let her say goodbye before she actually says goodbye. I think we're looking at a go date around early May, once the temperature hits 25 centigrade, more or less, and uh, the weather calms down, we're gonna find her a nice coastline and release her. It's tough. The treating is tough, dealing with them is tough, it's 24 seven, but the worst part is when you let them go because they leave with your heart, they're, they're thieves. You know? <laughs> so anyway, but I hope you enjoyed our talk. Thank you very much. pretty much heals over nicely there is no like she's sinking properly so we're not really worried about um, I mean it's called this nice bridging gap it's never going to be perfect like at first we were wondering if we'd have to put screws in to try to lift it higher but it's a little bit of an invasive procedure and it's 
We're not using that so much anymore so in veterinary so medicine. So, it one centimeter of growth? How much time did you take? Uh, well, she's been here since November. Yeah. And she really sealed up around the uh, end of January. Increasing the temperature helped. Yeah. The warmer the water temperature, the quicker they heal. So with her, we pumped it up to 32 for a week or two, and she loved it. Mm -hmm. But then I had to start bringing her back down to within natural range before she goes back to seed, so she doesn't you know, get shot. Do you clean the shell in the end? And is there some way to clean <laughs> yeah. the shell? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I ask, yeah. You ask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are. Uh, she loves you know. the broom. She loves the broom. So you actually her so she's like an animal, she feeds it with your Oh yeah, Absolutely. very sensitive shell. So she likes to be scrubbed and scratched. And she likes uh, like the, cat. the lower back scratch. Yeah. Like yeah. she'll just sit there and move back and forth yeah. and enjoy yeah. it. Because we yeah. think they don't feel anything because you know. No, no, she actually waits for uh, yeah. our uh, for Vedria to come in every morning. This is her routine. <laughs> to sit there and get her scratch and they do things. I don't know. Yeah. You know? So I'm a marine biologist also, and I work with I work with very close to this. And and in nature, they scrub their, their uh, oh, I forget the name. The shell. Yeah, the sh on, yeah. On, on several places so that they clean themselves. Mm -hmm. And in aquariums, sometimes what we do is that we put the, as a way to kind of environmental enrichment, we put some big brushes into the tank where we keep some of the tackle, and you see them blow into these brushes and just. Okay. Yeah, so their shell actually grows in two ways. So it can grow in surface area, the, the scoots, and it can also grow in thickness. So you do have this overchange in the from molting. You have you have this overchange in the shell, and sometimes it does have to be facilitated by rubbing up against brushes. She was uh, she was just molting and she was really cranky. <laughs> yeah. But the man careful, the big ones. They did what? Two hundred years? Uh, they can as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I want to say thank you guys. Thanks. Uh, the session was amazing. I have a question about stem cells. So I know you mentioned some of the algae right now Kuwait. We are we used to be like a Muslim run. And you know Kuwait is signing this contract with China to grow these about frozen antiquities in Ireland. So are you trying to address this issue right now since the lecture is about saving them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a that's trickier than treating them, you know. <laughs> I don't know the specifics. I've heard it's just what's in the news. Um, I will say this. 10, 15 years ago, there was nobody living south of NATO. You know, 20, 30 years ago, there was nobody living south of Sabmi and Pran. Human development or human encroachment is natural. It, it's, we're here. And it's very important to be holistic about it. You know, certain things you can save right now, certain things that, you know, it, they're gonna happen. Human development will happen. So what you do is you anticipate this happening in the future and you try as a marine biologist to prepare another avenue for these, for these turtles or for whatever ecosystem you're trying to protect. One way that's been done in the past is, for example, coral reefs, they put reef balls to attract the fish and to attract coral growth. So it's always a balance. Nothing is perfect good, nothing is perfect bad. You know, there's always a balance. But as far as these items, I, I can't really weigh in on it apart from what I read in the news so far. Yes, sir. I think the islands are gonna be Felica, Warba, Bobian. So it's gonna be in the north. The main nesting areas are gonna be Garol and Marad and Kupar. So yeah. I think the biggest problem would be they should keep those islands, at least Garol should be a national park. Should, yeah. They should be, nobody goes there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Except for authorized people, and they should know what they're doing and do things correctly, not. That's been floated around, I've heard this before, and, you know, in semi-official channels. I don't know what happened with that. Uh, the nice thing about Garo is it's fun. So, previously, its distance kept most people away. But as more people got more powerful engines for their boats, and more reliable engines, you started to see them more over there. It's, it's the most, Beautiful. Be not just beautiful, but it is the gut has the best coral reef. Yeah. It has, it's it's a treasure. Yeah. And, and it's really should be saved. And as far as the other islands, would it be possible to monitor, like they do in other countries, when they nest? We know when they nest, to make sure that nobody molests the the nests. Have some people guard them. 
And if that's not possible, um, perhaps relocate yeah. the eggs and hatch them and keep them in these facilities until like say one year old when they yeah. can better fend for themselves because the mortality is very high when they're hatching. So you kind of cheat and give them a head start for yeah. one year and they will actually have a much higher uh, survivorship. Okay, two things, Greg, if I may. Well, first of all, I that has been done in the past. It may still be happening. I'm not really with the, the group here that does the turtle nesting, but I know that at, at least up to recent history, uh, turtle nests were monitored. They were protected with a little enclave. So that has happened. To what degree, I can't speak. But you reminded me of being in graduate school. Our classes were in the evening, and the sea turtle guys, and the coral guy, they're laughing next door. And our lectures were 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And they had this, they would translate plant these eggs and the eggs would hatch and they would wait for nightfall and then after the lecture, so 9 p.m., they would cross the street and release them into the sea. And I used to sit in the back and they would keep the buckets next to me of new hatched turtles. And as cute as they are, 400 hatched turtles going <laughs> behind your head after three hours, it was, you really had, that's when I knew I, I loved them because I put up with that. <laughs> anyway, personal story there. It's less the, the, the department and more the people. Like I think that's the biggest problem. Uh, you know, we have things like at the zoo that says don't put your child over the crocodile. <laughs> so so I, I don't think it's like a I, I mean I do I would I would love that type of facility <coughs> like, like sea turtle rescue, we have like an actual facility where we're fully equipped and funded by the Haya. Um, <laughs> would be so nice, but like I think it's, um, I don't know if it's in the works or if it's possible to do well, it. You could, you could, you could say these are holy animals, Hello, you will go to the net. <laughs> that might work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, really interesting lecture, thanks. And, uh, about 14, 15 years ago, um, I went as a, a journalist with this group of um, people that were working out of the scientific center, and they were to um, Garo in August when it was the you know season for the turtles to hatch, and um, they dug up some of the the nests, and they took some of they took the um, hatchlings out, and some of the ones that that couldn't get out of the shells or that were in the very bottom of of the Nest, they helped them get out and they put them in uh, plastic bags with water and wet t-shirts and took them across the reef to, to give them a better chance. But at that time, they weren't really sure um, if it was the right thing to do because they weren't sure about the imprinting, if, if they would be imprinted and, and be able to come back, to find their way back to the same uh, beach to nest when they were adults. And then the other problem was that the Coast Guard station had this great big light and so when the hatchlings would hatch, instead of being attracted by the moon on the water, they would go the other way up the island and there were all these little hatchlings that were fried um, in the sun. So I wondered, did anybody ever talk to the Coast Guard and ask them to turn out the lights? And I wonder, you know, do you think this is the right thing to do, like to, to help them get across the reef or is it not the right thing? Thanks. Well, uh, well, I mean, we, we're helping them as adults, right? So, they we'll help them, no problem. I don't see a problem with helping an endangered animal survive, you know, unless it's like, I don't know, an endangered species of tick that is, you know, something bad to humans. But these these are critical to our ecosystem, yeah, and I, a lot of it, yeah. I don't. Uh, imprinting is definitely strong, but there are like acquired and learned behaviors that they can learn in populations. So I think if we're looking at that. Uh, as well, I don't think imprinting would be so much of a big issue. I think the imprinting happens actually from the, the chemical composition of the sand yes. that they're in, in the nest. So if you take them after they, they've already been imprinted, yeah. so if you take them, they'll still find those chemical cues. They, like salmon, they find the little the creeks from the ocean by just chemical cues. You know, you, you raise a very, very, actually very interesting point. This, from a research aspect, we think there's hybridization going on between species here. Uh, Jamila's case, 
she had one extra scoot. For, so if you were to count scoots, she's not a green turtle. She's an olive turtle. And I think uh, there were cases of that. But when we looked in the literature, there was 1% of all the green turtle populations had this extra scoot. <clears throat> so how are they reproducing? The imprinting, you know, I was also, when I was working with hatchlings, I was in the same mindset, you know, and that they're delicate, they imprint, you gotta be careful, don't let, you know, almost like what they do with, with rearing uh, hawks and all that, they use a puppet or something. But honestly, after working with them as adults, I am less concerned, personally, in my opinion, they'll, they'll be fine. They've been around for a hundred million years. Uh, yes? Just, just one, one more thing. Considering the imprinting is starting to occur in the current problem. So in Naples, this was a few years ago, when they tried in Naples, they have a long history concerning the character of sea turtles. And so we play with turtles with 30 years, three zero years in captivity. And they wanted to make sure they would survive. And they survived and there was no problems. So we have to have that quite basic in the way that they work. And so imprinting is quite hard. Now, looking on the other side of the reef, that is a more complex question. It's true that uh, I was in Brazil for a project Tamar, which is an important project in Sanity Turtle, and they never took the animals outside the reef. They were always removed from the reef. So that's the question I don't think anybody has an answer to that one. Yeah. But still, as you said, sometimes maybe it's worth to make the trial for the, yeah. you for see, the rest of the animals. The reef here, the Ngaro, is really, I mean, the distance is not that extreme. I'm talking maybe it was, I'm guessing, 50 meters, 100 meters from the coastline that they would take them. It's not like a fringing atoll in some of the Caribbean islands. So, but you know, this is funny. 30 years ago, I would have the same mindset. That they do very delicate things. But things have progressed and gotten easier to deal with because some of the things we were concerned about dealing with at the time have proven that they're not that big of a deal. The things that are now currently an issue of concern that I'm seeing a lot of in the literature is dioxins and various toxins that are being absorbed in their tissue from the ecosystem, either from the food they eat, from the water, that there's some issues, is, tur is sea turtle flesh now toxic? That's something, I, some publications on it. So there are new problems that are showing up with turtles. Are they becoming poisonous? Are they inadvertently, yes? Uh, you said a couple of times that uh, you saw them poaching, and is that when you know that this turtle needs help? How do you know when you see a turtle that this turtle needs rescue? Um, generally, if they're when they're when they're coming up, they're coming up for a little bit of sun, they're coming up for air, but they'll be swimming. They won't be like floating. So uh, if you put them in a tank and they're not sinking, that means they have a buoyancy disorder. So that means that there's air that's somewhere accumulated, whether it's the lungs or the or in the sealum, um, there's to look for cracks in the, sh in the shell, we run some x-rays. Um, the best thing to look at lung pathology is actually CT, which we don't have. It's the most sensitive. Um, so like even with Susan, when we were looking at, I was like, there's how, how are her lungs like perfect? Like out of everything that she's been through, how are her lungs still okay? And uh, one of the vets who wrote the paper on um, radiographic and like radiographic uh, diagnostics in, <coughs> and basically treatments for really camp sea turtles. He's told me that if you have CT, he's like, do CT, and he's like, I'll gladly read it for you and look at the lungs that way. He said it's much better than looking at an x-ray. Um, but when they're floating and they're not able to dive, that's definitely a problem because they're not gonna be able to eat. You know, if I may just interject more really quickly. This, David Attenborough is a big, I'm a big fan. I watch all his stuff and, I, and his, his voice is soothing like the sea to a sea turtle. But he would say one thing he had about the Galapagos, he said tortoises are tough. And I, how tough? But then you have to be tough to survive 100 million years. You know how much has changed in the global ecosystem? Temperature, water, CO2, you name it. They're still around. So they, they look delicate, they look cute and helpless, yeah. but they're tough. I mean, they're functioning, they can be happily functioning at less than a 5% hematocrit. Like people go to the hospital at like 